All right, well, here we go for week 34 of our Bible reading, and we are right in the midst of the book of Ezekiel. Now, with some of these videos, we've hit on some of the important dates in the history of the nation of Israel, the nation of Judah, and I want to do that again because, again, it gets kind of confusing about when these prophets were working, who they're speaking to, things like this. So let's remember the two big dates, 597 and 586. So in 597, uh, this was the first of the exile. Sometimes we think the exile took place just at one time, but actually it happened in waves. And so in 597, a group goes there, they are taken captive to Babylon. And Ezekiel, he finds himself being brought to that nation during this time. Now the other important date that we need to remember is 586 BC. And this is when the city of Jerusalem and the temple is destroyed. Now what happens in between those two dates is that Ezekiel, he's about 30 years of age, he receives his call to ministry, his call to be a prophet. And this happens in 593 BC. And so what we find in chapters 1 to 24 of the book of Ezekiel is really a five year period uh, where Ezekiel is doing his work. And so he is prophesying this doom and destruction. He's really given all these uh, visible signs as well about the destruction that is going to take place. And so what happens in 588 BC is that Babylon comes back, they lay siege against the city for two years, and then in 586 the city and the temple are destroyed. Now we remember from our reading with Jeremiah uh, that he was prophesying as well the destruction of the city. And we find in Jeremiah chapter 29 that he writes this letter to this group of exiles that was taken away in 597 that it's going to be a long time that they are in the land of Babylon. And what the false prophets were saying and what the people believed is that it would just be really a short time, maybe a couple years, and then they would be brought back. Part of the reason they had this confidence is because they had placed their confidence, really this overconfidence, in the city of Jerusalem and also the temple. They could just not imagine that the city and the temple would be destroyed. So again, they had this, this overconfidence in that place, in the temple. And I think that's a good word for us. What do we place our confidence in? You know, the people, they should have placed their confidence in the Lord and, and their faith in Him. But again, they went back to the city and to the temple. And so as we think about our own life, what are different things that we put confidence in? And some of this could be good things. It may be um, our baptism that you did. Maybe a great experience that you had at youth camp. You may have grown up in a Christian home. What I find sometimes talking to people about their faith and you say, you know, do you know Jesus? Uh, could you tell me a little bit about your story of knowing Christ? They don't talk about the personal work of Jesus. Instead, they go back to these things they put confidence in. Baptism, some experience they had growing up in a Christian home. And these are all great things. But yet, what is missing is talking about the person and work of Christ in their life, His perfect life, His death, and His resurrection, and how that applies to us. And so we need to think about that. You know, it might be a good kind of exercise, and, and I don't know if this is the way it's going to take place, but when we die and meet Christ, He may ask us a question of, of what have you placed your confidence in? And again, are you going to say some past experience, as great as that may have been, or are you going to say that my confidence is in you, Jesus? It's in what you have accomplished for me. I put my faith, my reliance on who you are and what you have done. All right, now as we end the video, I want to touch on this phrase that we see over and over in the book of Ezekiel, uh, the Son of Man. Uh, we see this again over and over again as it applies to Ezekiel, actually about 90 times. Now when you see that Son of Man, it may kind of catch your attention because this is a title given to Jesus. He actually refers to himself as the Son of Man. But it means something different when it's applied to Jesus versus Ezekiel. When it applies to Jesus, uh, and we really get more insight into this in Daniel chapter 7, it is speaking of Christ's humanity, but also that he is divine. Okay, He's the Messiah, and the, this Messiah is truly a human, but also truly God. And so this is what it means when, when Christ uses this title. But when it's applied to Ezekiel, it is just speaking of his humanity. So what we see in this book of Ezekiel is these great visions of the Lord, that he is eternal, that uh, he is glorious. And so when uh, Ezekiel is called the Son of Man, it's really this contrast between the eternal, glorious God 
and Ezekiel, who's just a human. Now we may hear that and say, ah, oh, that sounds kind of kind of tough, kind of this lowly picture. But it's important for us to have a proper perspective as we think about the Lord and also who we are. And as we think about that the Lord is glorious and eternal, and that we are, are temporal, that we are, are just humans, it puts our focus on the Lord and, and who He is, uh, that we can praise Him uh, for who He is, but also for what He has done in our life. Because what's amazing is that Jesus Christ is this eternal God, this glorious one that we find in the book of Ezekiel. And Jesus Christ, the Son of Man, He came to this earth. He lived among us. And we see that He loves us so much. We don't have this lowly picture of ourself we see how much Christ, how much God loves us, that He would come to this earth, live amongst us, die for us, so that we could be with the eternal and glorious God for all eternity. I just think that is amazing as we think about that term, the Son of Man, and how it applies to Jesus Christ.